So, first of all, uh, there are so many people of you here. Uh, thank you for coming. And, uh, well, we start with the layman's talk. And that the goal is always just to explain the title. So, it's base factors for research workers, and it's, uh, it's a tough job. I, thinking back about it, I just regret that we didn't use the, the actual title of my presentation, because uh, how can I explain this? So, I'll give you the real pre title of my PhD project, and that's Making Science Great Again, XOXO, Oxonoly, boom. <laughs> See? That's a title. That's something I can work with. See, it tells you that I have this idea, this intention to do something good. Uh, it also tells you there's a, perhaps a problem and that there's a solution. So let's start with the problem. The problem is a misunderstanding of p-values. So p-values were introduced and popularized by uh, Ronald Fisher in his 1925 book, Statistical Methods for Research Workers. And what you have to do, you have to do an experiment, you calculate one number, a p-value, and the p-value can be either significant or not significant. People interpret this as, well, we found an effect or we did not find an effect, and that's very black and white. This method is used for most of the research that you know. For instance, here, this is uh, red wine. People say, if you drink red wine, it has an effect on your health and you live longer, one glass of red wine a day. P was less than 0.05, but they did it again, the study, and then see that P is greater than 0.05. Now it says, well, red wine is not good for you. So what's going on, How, what should you do? Another one, that's, uh, this is my supervisor, it's EJ Wagenmakers, and there was an 1988 was a study that says, well, the idea is if you're happy, you smile. So if you smile, you're also happy, even if it's a fake smile, so you put your, a pen in your mouth, and you have this fake smile, and you'll be more, you'll be happier. So they said, yeah, that's true. And in 2016, it was not true anymore, so all your dreams shattered. So what's going on? So first was correct, then it's not. It's very black and white, and what's happening is, well, p value gives you premature conclusions. With the false information, we have fake, fake news, we have alternative facts, so it's very bad for science, and people have distrust in science now. So what's, let's go a little bit deeper into the problem of p-value. So, and I'm going to explain this with the following example. And people show that lonely people shower warmer. And how would we do that? So we have on the, on the horizontal axis loneliness. You measure someone, how lonely someone is and how warm they shower. And you assume that there's no effect. So if I change my loneliness, I will not show, shower warmer or colder. Well, this, there's no no effect is an average of the population. Each dot represents a person in your population, and actually the whole population, meaning people from China, Africa, the US, Trump, so everyone is in there. And the best thing to verify is just ask everyone in the population, but you don't, can't do that because nobody answers you, and that's, uh, you, you can't measure everyone. So this black line you can't see. Instead, what you can do is look at the subset. So for instance, you take four people. There you go, these red dots represent four people, and you draw the best line through it. Even though there's no effect in the population, this red line is not completely straight. So you can't um, take that as a fact, so you can't have that on face value. Another four, it goes down again, it's not completely straight. Another four, another four, another four. If you draw them all, none of them are actually exactly horizontal. So, Fisher said, well, with some added, added mathematical assumptions, you can say, well, most of the time when you take four, four data points and you draw a line through it, it's in between the, these boundaries, the black boundaries there. And he said, well, every time you have a, a line that's above the boundary, then you have extreme data. Okay. So, let's do an example of extreme data. Okay. And I don't draw, so if I do experiment, I don't draw from people from China, Africa, whatsoever, I draw around my friends. So suppose I draw my friends, Bert and Ernie. They shower together, as you can see. And the red dots are here. They are not completely the same because there's individual differences. People consider heat differently and all. So that, that's a big thing. Another one I draw is uh, Dora. It's my paronym, accidentally. And she is extremely smart and uh, 
quite lonely because nobody understands her, and she showers <laughs> quite warm. And we also have, accidentally, I draw uh, Sasha. Sasha is also extremely uh, uh, smart. He's also assistant professor, and we go to the gym together. He's not lonely at all, and we have to shower quite cold to cool our hot bodies. So as you can see, there it is. So let's go to the data. If this doesn't tell you batshit crazy, and think about this as extreme data, now let me draw you a line. There you go. It's above these two boundaries. And based on that, it's not likely that it happens on the, if there's no effect, but because we see that, we just say that. Well, we showed that there is an effect that the longer you get, the warmer you shower. So let's go back. So this is the logic of p-values. You have the reason on the population to your data, and every time you see a p.05, you say, this pipeline is broken. So, and it could mean either that the null hypothesis, there's no effect, is broken, or the assumptions are broken. So you're actually very uncertain about your conclusions, but your answer is significant or non-significant, which is just black and white. So you're very, very certain about something that you're actually uncertain about. So what's the solution is base factors, and uh, they are introduced by Harold Jeffries. This is Harold Jeffries. You might see it on the cover of my, present, of my uh, thesis, that's him as well. And he said, well, what we have to do, we have to do a fair comparison. So instead of doing only a null hypothesis, you also have to consider this red thing here. There is an effect, so you have to compare them with the same assumptions. Second of all, you have to learn from your data. It's very straightforward. You have to go from observation from your data to your population. That comes with a price. You have to do that. You have to uh, construct priors, and priors are on the right-hand side. And together, this gray box here, that gives you the base factor. That's my job, I have to construct base factors. So let's return to the problem here. So the problem was that we used to have only, there is an effect, there's no effect. And the base factor can give you something in between. So here this is the, so there is an effect and base factor of nine tells you it's nine times more likely that there is effect than there's no effect, that the data will generate uh, from that there is an effect and there's no effect. And the higher it is, the more evidence you have. So this goes to, the, goes to the top, and this goes down. So for instance, we have one study that looks like this, and you can see that you slowly learn. You learn, learn more and more with more data points. And you can do another study and continue this on. And as you can see, well, we keep on learning. So that's great about base factors. It's very dynamic. You could also have an example where it doesn't go in the right direction, then things go the other way around. And that happened qu quite a lot. And these, these lines, these are based on this little formula here. And most people are, well, at least people using it are quite scared of it. And what you have to do, so uh, I've told you about base factors, you know what base factors are, and this is the formula. Okay, so what? So now I have to figure out, so for research workers, so now people have to use it. So I, we implemented it with a, massive team to put it in a computer software, which is open source, everybody can use it, it's for free, and you can uh, just do the things that we showed, you, uh, what I just showed you. So what's the take-home message? Seeing the world in black and white is very bad. Uh, the world has many shades of gray, some say 50, but in the long run, you need some nuance. You have to, you don't say yes, no all the time, but you have to learn from your data. That's the most important thing. And I try to be useful, so I make them accessible and have them in a computer program. So I hope you understand what my title means now, Base Facts for Research Workers. And I'm very happy that you're all here. So uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. <laughs>